because while all relationships fluctuate over time, and Hezbollah's relationship with Iran, as intense and intimate as it has always been, has also fluctuated over time. Certainly, Hezbollah's relationship with Syria has fluctuated over time. Right? There was a time, shortly after the Marine barracks bombing, when Imad Mugnia, the late head of Hezbollah's terrorist wing, and his brother-in-law, Mustafa Badruddin, who I believe is now taken over for him as the head of Hezbollah's terrorist wing, oversaw the bombing of the Marine barracks, sat in a building and watched it with binoculars, and ran away to Iran as, as things got too hot. Later they came back, and they had to flee back to Iran after not too long. Why? Because at the time, Hezbollah and Syria weren't getting along too well. And Hezbollah had carried out some attacks against the Syrian military, and the Syrians were trying to kill Imad Mugnia. Not always, but this particular point. That was one time how they were. Look at how they are today. A very, very different relationship. All relationships fluctuate over time. But it's a fact that back then, the relationship was so tight that Iran said, I need you to do this, do it now. And they did even though it could have cost them, and that that is the way the relationship is now. The U.S. intelligence community for a long time, quietly, now publicly, the head of the National Counterterrorism Center, the uh, director of national intelligence, testified publicly, describing the relationship between Iran and Hezbollah, their words, not mine, as a strategic partnership, an approximation relationship, a strategic partnership with Iran as the primary partner. And that's very, very telling as we move forward, as we think about where Hezbollah has become over time. Before I continue with the story, I have to make, have to make a confession. Um, and that is that this entire project, this entire book was a mistake. I had other things I had planned to do. This was not on my agenda. I had left youth government service. I had left the FBI. I was out for about a year or so. I was finishing at the time a book on Hamas. And I got invited to a US government conference here in Washington, DC, unclassified, but by invitation only for current and former US intelligence analysts on the Levant. Great. I go to this conference, and the first two panels were people speaking about really detailed things in Lebanon. The conference was co-sponsored by the CIA and State Department's Intelligence and Research Branch, INR, State Department's Intelligence in house shop. And someone from State or CIA moderated each panel, but the panelists themselves were almost all people who were brought Lebanon. The first two panels were all about really nitty-gritty, this family, that tribe, the more you learn about Lebanon, an amazing country, wonderful people, the more you learn, you have to get to learn. And I, certainly then in 2003, had a lot more left to learn about things domestic to Lebanon. First two panels are going, and I'm taking copious notes, and I'm not the type to do that at every conference, and I can't write fast enough. Loving it. And the third panel, uh, panel comes up, and I start talking about something that I actually do know something about, terrorism militancy in the Middle East. And from the very first moment they open their mouths, they are so far out twilight zone, so far removed from reality. It's like a ton of bricks falling on my head. I'm wondering, are these guys crazy? Or has everybody at this conference so far been crazy? And I just didn't know because the first two panelists, I, beyond my expertise, I have nothing to measure against. The panelists would get up and they'd say things like, look, I know you Americans and Israelis, there are no Israelis there, but I know you Americans and Israelis don't like Hezbollah. Hezbollah engages in resistance against, uh, as they put it, resistance against Israel. You're very close to Israel, so you don't like Hezbollah. I understand that. But let's be grown ups here. You have to stop saying that Hezbollah does terrorism around the world. They just don't. That's Al Qaeda. Okay? It's enough already. And I'm looking around. This is a room of 200, 250 current and former U.S. intelligence analysts whose careers have been spent going, you know, dealing with the fact that, in this case, Hezbollah has, unfortunately, engaged in sporadic acts of violence around the world, terrorism around the world. This is coming out of left field. This has beyond uh, just fighting Israel across the border or what have you. Fine. And then the next panel comes along, and there's a person who, an American who's been living in, in Beirut for many, many years, an academic, who said, listen, I know that you Americans and Israelis believe that there's some arch terrorist out there, some boogeyman, is how the person put it, making fun, called Imad Mugnia. But I don't believe the person exists. I lived in Beirut, this academic said, and I've never seen any evidence he exists. Think about that for a minute. Because if he is, in fact, the head of Hezbollah's terrorist group, he'd come up to you and say, oh, Zainab, let's have coffee sometime, right? <laughs> okay. I lived in Beirut, this person said, and I've never seen any evidence he exists. So I did say this academic what a real academic would do. I went and I got an audience with Hassan Nasrallah himself, the head of the Secretary General of Hezbollah. And I said to him, Yes, Sayyid, does Mugnia exist? And he told me no. But ergo, Mugnia doesn't exist, QED. 
the book tour has taken me several times to Chicago, so you'll allow me to make the comparison. It's kind of like, kind of like going up to a crime boss. I don't know, maybe Al Capone, and saying, "Hey, Al, are you a crime boss?" And Al says, "No, I'm in the tr I'm in the trash disposal business." And so you then go to a conference and you can say, "Al Capone is not a crime boss." I know because he told me so. He's in the trash disposal business. On the sidelines of the conference, this academic and I got into a discussion, but politely say we agreed to disagree. This is in 2003. Fast forward five years, February. 2008, Imad Mugnia is assassinated in Damascus. So it's now clear, as Hezbollah embraces this man, who, whose existence was denied in life, believe it or not, Nasrallah actually lied, I mean, he did exist, is embraced in death. Squares are named after him, Hezbollah posts poetry about him on their website, most of it's not very good, but okay. And I'm not a very nice or mature person, I've never claimed to be. Um, my wife and I have four boys. The way I like to put it is I have four sons. My wife has five boys, and I'm not the most mature of the bunch. She's heard me say that many times, and she's never once corrected me, so I'm okay. And I, I, I sat down to write an email to this academic from the conference five years earlier, a very short email, just said, and now we're both right. He did exist. And now he doesn't exist. My wife, looking over my shoulder, says, that's not the most mature email. So I didn't send the email. But I have to admit that I'm also a very petty person, because I felt a lot better just having drafted it, even though I didn't send it. A few days later, at his funeral, Nasrallah appears by video teleconference, not in person for fear that he would also be the target of an attack. And he says, Israel, you want his words, open war? I'll give you open war. Meaning, you want to conduct an attack against us in Syria, outside the immediate area? Fine. We'll also we'll, we'll respond at a time and place of our choosing outside, somewhere around the world. Now, it's interesting, you'll read about it in the book, it's not quite clear from, from some declassified material that neither Iran nor Hezbollah were entirely sure or convinced that the Israelis were behind the Lugni assassination at the time when Nasrallah made this threat. I think it's quite clear that they are now convinced. I don't know, but probably right, that the Israelis were involved in it. But at the time, they were not convinced at all that that did not stop Nasrallah from saying that it was the same way that uh, when uh, a, a bomb strikes, uh, double suicide bombing strikes the Iranian embassy in Beirut, or when Hashem Sanihil Lakis, who actually uh, features prominently in the book, uh, there's a lot of FBI material about him when he was overseeing a procurement network here in North America, when he was assassinated a couple of weeks ago, the Iranians, Hezbollah, will always say that it was the Israelis, whether it was, was or whether it wasn't. Um, but at the time, they weren't quite so sure. Who were they really concerned about again? The Syrians. A whole interesting story. But be that as it may, it only takes a few months before you start seeing a series of plots around the world. First, an attack, an attempted attack on the Israeli ambassador in Baku, Azerbaijan, then plots against uh, current and former senior Israeli officials in West Africa, several attacks in the Eastern Med, including in Turkey, and each of them uh, it, try and fail, try and fail, and I think that there's a reason. When I was at the FBI, my last assignment was working 9-11. I led the analytical team for Flight 175. Because Bubba was not involved in 9-11. They weren't. The 9-11 Commission Report makes some interesting notations. There was a flight with some of the hijackers at one point from Beirut to Tehran. And on that flight was not only some of the hijackers, but some Hezbollahis. But we don't know if that was planned, if it was coincidence. right? Probably not so uncommon for there to be Hezbollah members on flights from Beirut to Tehran. Who knows, maybe it's something, maybe it isn't. But Hezbollah was not involved in 9-11. And yet they, probably like other groups, all kinds of groups, saw 9-11 and said, whoa, we do not want to be caught in the crosshairs of what we were then calling a war on terrorism. They did not want to be put in the same box as Al-Qaeda. And while both Hezbollah and Al-Qaeda are terrorist groups, both of them target civilians, they are very, very, very different. Hezbollah is a terrorist group and many other things. It is, in fact, a political party. You like them, you don't like them, they are. It is, in fact, a social welfare movement. It is, in fact, a standing motion. It is all of those things. But the reason I wrote the book is because you could actually look and find material on Hezbollah's actions within those areas quite openly. When I left this conference in 2003, I did a literature review. How could it be that all these people are saying these crazy things about Hezbollah? Hezbollah never does terrorism. Maybe I thought to myself, I'm the problem. Maybe I only know that they do this because I've worked on these issues in the intelligence community. Maybe in the open source world it's just not so clear. But we did a literature review and it turns out there wasn't quite as much, but there was plenty of literature on Hezbollah in terms of its open source activities. 
which is how I ended up writing this book. And I stated at the outset of the book, by the way, I should have mentioned, the purpose of this book is not to be the new book on Hezbollah. You only have to read this. To the contrary. I don't deal in this book with Hezbollah as a political party, even though it is. It's a very important political party. I don't deal with Hezbollah as a social welfare movement or even very much as a militia. Not because it isn't any one of those things. It is. Not because all any of those things aren't important. They are. But because there's tremendous literature out there on those things. The gap, what was missing, was a recognition of Hezbollah's activities beyond. And not just actual terrorist operations, but logistics, finance, arms procurement, all these different types of illicit, criminal, and other activities around the world. And that's what we tried to provide here uh, in the book. So as Hezbollah tried to avenge Mugnia's death in the first couple of years after his assassination, they tried and failed, they tried and failed in large part because when 9-11 happened and they didn't want to be caught up in the crosshairs of the sworn terrorism, they literally withdrew from abroad many of their trigger pullers. As you'll read in the book, Hezbollah at one point was maintaining caches of arms in places like Manila, in the Philippines, different places around the world, not necessarily huge storehouses, a box buried in the ground, but to be able to do things on very short notice if they wanted. But now, at post 9 11, the people who could have done those things, who were actually trained in making bombs go boom and pulling triggers, they were not stationed abroad, they were not on the ground. They left their financiers, their logisticians, their procurement officers, and in a couple of cases, they were so desperate to avenge Mugnia's death that they actually told people who were not trained as assassins or not trained as uh, uh, people to be able to carry out uh, reconnaissance and had them engage in those types of activities because, well, they were there in Thailand, in Egypt, and other places. They had people on the ground smuggling weapons, putting together precursor, chemical precursors for, for bombs. People had been functioning quite well for some time, and then they're told, go do surveillance of Israelis, go do surveillance of Americans, and then they get picked up. Not very good operational security, but it's what they had. So in mid-2009, after these successive failures, because frankly their operational capabilities around the world, beyond the militia, had rusted on the mine, they approached the Iranians and they say, listen, Mugnia was important to us, he was important to you, this is definitely true, you need to give us a little more help than usual. And the Iranians said, fine. And for an operation in Istanbul, targeting the Israeli consul general there, Iran provided more logistical support than usual. For an attack, September 2009, that was also foiled. And now you have this rare situation in the end of 2009, confirmed to me by multiple different countries. And you know, when, when I make confirmed, I don't mean you go up to someone and say, hey, I hear from the Americans that this was happening. What do you think? You, know, you just have a conversation with them and you let them tell you without leading them along. Independently, several different countries saying, you know, by the way, in late 2009, Iran and Hezbollah are very angry at each other. No, they're very angry. Hezbollah is saying, you know, Iran you used to be a really reliable patron and partner, but now you're more than a little distracted by this nuclear program. And Iran's saying, you know, Hezbollah you used to be extraordinarily capable, but now not so much. And this is all put to bed just a few weeks later, not because they resolved their differences, but because in January 2010, somebody places a magnetic sticky bomb in the car of Professor Mohammadi, a nuclear scientist in Iran on his way to work and kills him. And the Iranians, as you can imagine, are very angry, as we would be angry if something like that happened here on the streets of Washington. And they call in the Quds Force, and they call in Hezbollah, and they say, that's it, no more bickering. This is how it will be. Quds Force, you are going to establish a new unit. They call it Unit 400. And your job is to assassinate diplomats from countries trying to undermine our nuclear program. And we saw plots in the Republic of Georgia, and in Thailand, and in India, and in Azerbaijan, and in Africa, Africa targeting the Brits, there was an assassination of Saudis, most of them targeting Israelis, but in Azerbaijan targeting not only the U.S. ambassador, not only other members of the U.S. embassy, a plot specifically targeting American interests, but also members of their families, which is crossing an unwritten, an unwritten red line. And by the way, at least one of the two people who was tapped setting up Unit 400 is someone we've known well, because at one point he was an Iranian agent stationed here in Los Angeles, targeting Iranian dissidents here in the United States without much success, in part because law enforcement authorities were quite aware of him and weren't very much on top of him. 
he fled the country before being arrested, started doing the same thing in London, also without great success, and gets promoted to this Unit 400 thing. He's not a very capable guy, which explains why we now know he personally, individually, went and did some of the free operational surveillance in Thailand, in Baku, in Georgia, and in India, and in each of those places used the exact same SIM card, which is not the best operational security. Meanwhile, though, Hezbollah was given two tasks. The first is stop. Just, just stop. You admitted yourself, you rusted on the mine, your capabilities aren't what they once were, so here's what your first assignment is. You take six, seven, eight months off. You recruit the creme de la creme from your militia, from the Mukawama, from the Islamic resistance, which during all this time the terrorist capability had kind of rusted, the Mukawama had been built up quite significantly, and their, their military capabilities, as we're seeing in Syria, are quite good. And the Israelis would be the first to tell you. I want you to recruit from there, said the Iranians, said the Quds Force. People with foreign complexions, people with foreign languages, people who have traveled abroad, preferably people with foreign nationalities, foreign passports. And then, once you've taught them the dark arts, we've taught them the dark arts, then and only then, dispatch them to target Israeli tourists around the world. I know, I know, said the Iranians, to target some, some Israeli citizen, some Israeli tourist, that's an insufficient, embarrassingly low-level, soft target. That, that can't be enough to avenge Mugnia. To avenge Mugnia, the Prince of Hezbollah, you have to hit a similarly senior, current, or former Israeli official. Fine, let that continue. That plot line continues. But to exact the cost on the Israelis, said the Iranians, for what we, the Iranians, perceive them to be doing on their own in tandem with other Western powers, targeting our nuclear program, to, to send a message to them, all you have to do is hit some civilians. And they did. We saw plots in many different places. And, of course, the one success in Burgas, Bulgaria. They killed one uh, Muslim Bulgarian European citizen, five Israelis, and, and wounded uh, several dozen more. Now, it's not like on TV, Homeland or other television shows, which is a former FBI person I have a very hard time watching, because that's not how it is. A, it's not that exciting. Most of the time, you're sitting at a desk doing really boring things. And B, every time in, like, the 24 in particular, almost every commercial ends with a bomb going off and his, his phone gets destroyed, and by the end of the commercial, he's got a new phone. Do you have any idea how much paperwork, time, <laughs> and it takes to get a new government issue phone? Anyway, it's not like on these TV shows, where in those cases where a terrorist group, or other illicit actor for that matter, engages in a really good operational security, they necessarily succeed, and when they make mistakes, they necessarily fail. And I'll just show you from the examples of Hezbollah in Bulgaria, where they made big mistakes and succeeded. And a week and a half earlier, in Cyprus, where they had incredible operational security and failed. Hezbollah did exactly as they were told. They went out, they recruited foreigners. Within six months, in Thailand and in Cyprus, two Lebanese-Swedish dual nationals are arrested. They both have since been tried and convicted. Not by an American court, not by an Israeli court, by a Cypriot court, by a Thai court. We've had many other cases around the world over the past few years, and many, many other cases well, they have not gone to trial because we haven't captured the individuals. One case in Nigeria where they were not convicted of specifically Hezbollah issues, but on, on other weapons charges. Um, in Bulgaria, among other things, and there were a whole bunch of mistakes, my favorite is the driver's license. There were three individuals, one dual Lebanese Australian citizen, one dual, two dual Lebanese Canadian citizens. We don't know the second guy's identity. He died in the explosion. But we know that he's related, that two, by DNA the two are related. First, we thought that this was a suicide bombing because the guy died in the explosion. We now know definitively from Europol investigation of the device that it was remotely detonated. It was not a suicide bombing. And what we think from interviewing some of the Israeli tourists who survived is, is we understand that as, as the tourists were putting their suitcases under the bus, you know, a compartment under the tour bus, uh, an Israeli put his suitcase where he wanted it. And somebody, the bomber, comes along and moves it over to put his backpack with the bomb right there. And the tourist got angry. No, no, that's what I put in my suitcase. Why this was important to him, I don't know, but he wanted his suitcase where he wanted it. They get into a little tussle, and apparently the other two saw something was going wrong, didn't know what, didn't want to take a chance, and hit the button remotely, even though their buddy, their relative, was still there. A mistake. But the bigger mistake is that the guy who died was carrying this license. A Michigan 
U.S. license. Not, a, not the latest U.S. license, but licenses are good for 10 years in this country, and it was a very, very, very good fake license. As well as, as you'll read in the book, second to none counterfeit capabilities, counterfeit money, counterfeit documents, you name it. And the counterfeit, the quality of this document was very, very, very good, except that beyond the document itself, there were two things wrong with it. One is, you can look online, you can see the picture. Uh, one is, the, the guy's wearing a wig in the picture, and it's a terrible wig. I mean, you look at this picture and you feel like you're watching a scene out of Saturday Night Live. It's a terrible wig. You'd only wear that if you were trying to be silly, but, but he wasn't, right? Uh, I picture the, the forger in a, in a dark room with one of those banker lights over his desk working over his, his masterful piece of art, his fake document, and someone comes in and says, sir, I, I have the picture to, to, to put in there. And he says, are you crazy? I'm supposed to put this ridiculous picture into this, but that's all we have. Okay, so maybe that's not the forger's mistake. He had to work with what he was given. But what was his mistake, the bigger mistake, is that this Michigan license had an address on it in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. <laughs> that is on the forger. Now, mind you, it wasn't so huge a mistake that the young woman working for the summer at a car rental agency at the Burgess Airport knew, right? The same way we might not know that one city in, you know, Bulgaria is close or far from another city in Bulgaria. But a big, big mistake, and there were many other mistakes, and yet they succeeded in that operation. A week and a half earlier, Hussam Yakub, Swedish Lebanese citizen, is arrested. Uh, conducting surveillance of Israelis getting off their tour buses, uh, getting off the airplane and getting off the tour buses the exact same way. Someone, us, the Israelis, not clear, tells the Cypriots about this guy, they do surveillance of him, and then they then go back to the, to the hotel, they get a warrant to arrest him, a warrant to search all his stuff, and they arrest him. He at first denies everything. I, I've been back to the airport since I got here. Really? Because here's the surveillance picture of you there, and and here's the video, oh, there you are, and you're writing down the license plate numbers. Okay, okay, well, I went back to the airport, but there's nothing illegal about that. I, I don't know what you're talking about. That has nothing to do with Hezbollah. In fact, he had very good R2I, resistance to interrogation training. Same type of training we teach our military, our intelligence professionals. And that is, again, not like on TV. In the real world, you don't train people never, ever talk if you get captured. There's no such thing, never, ever talk. What you teach people is, at first, the first two days, either don't talk at all or deny everything. And then the next few days or a week later, you can say some, but don't say all, and maybe weave in some truth and some falsehood. And then eventually, a week, two weeks into it, just tell it all. The point is, so that if I get captured, you and you and you, the rest of my team, you can all get back to safety, roll up, and that's what you're trying to do. And he does that very, very well. But ultimately, after first saying, well, okay, I told you I wasn't Hezbollah, right? Well, I, actually, I, I was. I was recruited by Hezbollah. But he told the whole story. I was recruited by a guy named Rami. I'd never met him before. This guy, Rami, approaches me on the streets of Beirut at this falafel stand. And I have no idea why he approached me. And he comes up with this whole Sakamani story. A couple of days later, he says, by the way, remember I told you about Rami? Rami doesn't exist. Here's how I was actually recruited. And when was he recruited? Well, you might think, because I just told you, that in January 2010, the Iranians told Hezbollah to recruit just guys like him. Maybe he was recruited sometime around January 2010 or afterwards. And that'd be an informed and wrong guess. And so you might think, because I just told you, that you know, they decided to try and avenge Mubadiyah's death after February 2008, so maybe he was recruited sometime after, after February 2008. And that would also be a, an informed but wrong guess. We know he was recruited more than a year earlier. Early 2007, Hezbollah was already looking in this direction. They had already sent him to Cyprus on multiple missions using incredible operational security. No rush, very slowly. The first few times you go to Cyprus, a vacation. We'll pay for it. And all you have to do is meet people, befriend people, pass your card around, and you keep going back. And after a while, there are a whole bunch of people in Cyprus who know you. He can't be a Hezbollah terrorist. I know him. He's my friend. <coughs> You'll read about the whole story of Hussein Mekub. It's an amazing story. At the end, in the last uh, interview with Cypriot police, and I have the entire transcript, the official Cypriot government transcript from the interrogations. That's what I'm pointing to, not from some New York Times article or from some uh, you know, uh, unattributed interview. This is direct quotes from the Cypriot government transcription of their meeting with him. And I'm not doing the translation either. This is the 
the, the official secret government translation by an official translator, he says in the last mission, the past couple of days, he's admitted that he's as well. <coughs> he's admitted that he's done the surveillance of the Israelis. But he's insisting this is not terrorism. <coughs> this is resistance. It's completely different. In his mind, if you blow up a busload of Israeli civilians, <coughs> but it's for a cause called resistance, it's not terrorism. And he, he believes this. And he says to them on the last day, look, he says, I told you I was Bala, yes, and yes, I, I did that surveillance, but he said, and I quote, I was just, quote, unquote, not my words, I was just carrying out surveillance of the Jews. This is what my organization does all over the world. And he's saying it kind of incredulous, like, what's the big deal? This is what we do. This is not terrorism. This is, I told you I'm his bubble. We do surveillance of the Jews all over the world, but, but why is this a big deal? <coughs> I don't, I'd argue that's a big deal. I'd argue what his is doing in Syria today is a very, very big deal. And in some ways, it's a bigger deal for Hezbollah than for anybody else. Wrap your arms around, wrap your heads around this. Hezbollah has spent tremendous <coughs> amounts of time, frankly, Iranian money, trying to present itself as a resistance organization. It tries to build, again, Hezbollah's words, not mine, a culture of resistance in Lebanon, especially since the Israeli withdrawal from southern Lebanon in 2000. Especially since after that, the July 2006 war, which Nasrallah himself admits was a mistake, and admits that it started because he sent people to kidnap Israeli soldiers from within Israel across the border of Israel proper. And especially since Hezbollah took over downtown Beirut by force of arms, not two years later in 2008. You have to build this culture of resistance to still have standing without the raison d'etre of needing to push Israel out of Lebanon, they're out, and trying to explain to people why it is you started a war as Lebanese and Israelis both didn't want in 2006, targeted fellow Lebanese, literally killed fellow Lebanese in 2008 when the government of New Zealand banned Hezbollah's military when they cited the takeover of downtown Beirut in 2008 by their definition as an act of international terror. Well, today, tell me what resistance Hezbollah is doing in Syria. They're not resisting Israeli occupation in Syria. Now, they will say time and again, and fewer and fewer people believe in Australia, says, in Syria we are defending the Palestinians. Okay, sure. But this is undermining their position. Right now, you want to ask me who assassinated Hassan Hulu I don't know. Could have been the Israelis. I don't know. They do that type of thing. But frankly, much more likely right now, coming right after the double suicide bombing of the Iranian embassy, Hezbollah's greatest, most immediate enemy and threat right now is not the Israelis. It's the Sunni rebels in Lebanon and Syria both. Wrap your hands around this. Hezbollah spends tremendous amounts of time media, the, the, the website, trying to convince fellow Lebanese that everything it does, everything it does, is in the Le Lebanon's interest. You may not understand, you may not agree, but the war in 2006, everything ultimately in Lebanon's interest. It's not in our interest as a party. It's not in the Shia interest alone, it's just that, that one segment, that one sectarian ethnic segment of the larger Lebanese community. Certainly not in Iranian's interest. It's first and foremost in Lebanon's interest, and if it's also in some other interest, that may be too. It's always we are doing what's in the best interest of Lebanon. You can't make that argument with Syria. In Syria, Hezbollah, long before Al-Qaeda was organized in this, in this war, helped take a rebellion that became a civil war and transformed it into a sectarian conflict that respects and knows no boundaries and is bleeding over those boundaries east and west. And we're seeing that today. And if you're a Lebanese, are Lebanese here in the room? I'm not. But if you're Lebanese, tell me if I'm wrong, of any confessional faith community, your greatest fears are in the civil war, which Lebanese have suffered far more than they ever should have. And what Hezbollah is doing more than anybody else is increasing the likelihood, God forbid, of renewed civil war in Lebanon. To say that what you're doing in Syria is in Lebanon's interest is ridiculous. <coughs> Hezbollah has created a situation where it has put itself on the top tier of our international terrorist concerns. Not only because it is back in the terrorism business since 2008 in ways it hadn't been since late 1980s, early 1990s. And in Europe, but also what it's doing in the region. For some European governments who decided to ban the military and terrorist wings of Hezbollah, Hezbollah plots in Cyprus, in Bulgaria, recruitment in Denmark, other activities in Europe, that was the driving factor. 
others, like France, the driving factor was look at how they're undermining stability, not only in the region, not only next door in Lebanon, but in and Syria, but in Lebanon. And they have created a situation where they are facing a tremendous ideological crisis. Because they are not fighting the Israelis. And frankly, right now, with the exception of Israelis targeting weapons transfers to them, the Israelis aren't fighting them. Among the things that were most amazing to me in the book was the fact that while it's well known that Hezbollah and Israel fight each other, it's less well known what happens abroad. While some people are aware of the bombing of the Israeli embassy in Buenos Aires in 1992, and the bombing will be 30 years this, uh, uh, this July of the uh, Amiya Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires on July 18th, the same day of the Burgess Bulgaria bombing just a couple of years ago. Uh, the Kovar Towers bombing in the eastern province of Saudi Arabia, where there's a whole lot of tension going on right now, as, as we were talking before. There's a lot less knowledge of what Hezbollah does in the Western Hemisphere, certainly in North America, where the activity is tremendous, and Africa and Southeast Asia. So, for example, while most people are aware of the Amiya bombing in 1994, in July, very few people are aware, and fewer people still of the details, of how Hezbollah came this close to blowing up the Israeli embassy in Bangkok, Thailand, just a few weeks earlier. And what I was able to do is get from the from several governments in Southeast Asia, their, again, not, not American, not Israeli, but their uh, police and intelligence reports of these attacks. The bottom line at this conference in 2003 is that no one had bothered to do this research. It wasn't stuff you could do research by Google. You had to get off your rear and either travel the world and or wait till people came here, and I did both. Uh, but meeting with people from Argentina and Chile and Singapore and Thailand and the Philippines and Jordan and Kuwait and almost every European country and Canada and Israel, the United States and all the, but all over the world. I mean, the Romanians had a fight. And you put it all together over the course of years and there are certain things that stand out. Hezbollah does have a presence around the world, but they're not like Al-Qaeda. They won't hit you every time they can. But for Hezbollah, violence is no more or less a legitimate tool than anything else. If I can get you to do what I need you to do without violence, fine. That's fine. I don't need to use violence. But if I can get you to do what I want you to do even faster or easier with violence, then that's fine too. It's no more or less legitimate, illegitimate, comfortable, uncomfortable. It's just a tool. And the other thing that comes out, and with this I will finish, is how over the years, from the Beirut bombings, certainly through today, as we discussed, the strategic partnership with the Rhine, again, fluctuated sometimes over time, but always intimate, always strong. And you don't need to take my word for it. And this is not me coming to that conclusion and writing a book about it. This is me traveling the world and getting documents, actual documents, court documents, police documents, from everywhere, from the French to the Chileans and everywhere in between, and what you see all these different governments reporting is not only the Hezbollah presence and the nature of their activities and the criminal activities that are going on, but the intense relationship with Iran.